Well, there was a movie, what was it, last summer or two summers ago, Me Before You, and it was a story of a quadriplegic who uh, felt that his quality of life was, was nothing, and even though he loved his personal care assistant, he opted for suicide. And all of his family and all of his friends said, he made a courageous, noble, dignified decision. And I'm, th I'm sitting there in the audience as a quadriplegic thinking, no, he didn't. Yeah. He, he opted out. He, 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 he took the cowardly way out. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Johnny, welcome back to Focus. Good to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this, this troubling topic that's uh, influencing not only our uh, nation's laws, but also the Christian community. Yeah, well you, in many ways, I'm sure years ago you didn't sign up for this. I will be an expert in physically challenged uh, you know, lives. Right. 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I broke my neck in that diving accident, and and uh. Uh, my goodness, I was athletic, I was on the go, I was hopeful about um, heading off to college, and, and here my plans were drastically altered when I took that dive, a reckless dive, and snapped my neck and severed my fourth uh, cervical vertebrae that cut my spinal cord and left me a quadriplegic. And I could not believe it when doctors said I would never walk, never have use of my hands. And I began to translate that, uh, Jim and John. I, okay, this means somebody's going to wipe my butt, do yeah. my toileting routines. This means somebody's going to have to cut up my food and feed me. Yeah. This means I'm going to have to have bed baths and someone is going to have to brush my teeth and wipe my spit and, yeah. and clean my runny nose. And, 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 and I don't want to live like that. And I guess it's why when I talk to many Christ followers who struggle with disability, um, they are thinking more and more about, why should I have to go through this? My quote, quality of life is so poor. You know, physician assisted suicide is not a bad idea perhaps. I have literally talked to quadriplegic friends who are thinking, seriously thinking about opting out of life because of what they feel is uh, dehumanizing and undignified care. Johnny, I so appreciate that boldness. Mm. I mean, what you shared is so straightforward. It makes us wince, especially if we have the use of our bodies. We're going, wow, think of that, all those things that you mentioned. But let me ask you, in that same way, that pervasive thought then is, well, maybe it's okay mm. for them to select an easy way out because of the pain they're in. Well, and, of course, I don't ascribe to that. I'm just trying to posture the way people rationalize physician-assisted suicide today. Which puts our listeners who are Christ followers in such a key and influential position. You know, we were reading a statistic just before airtime. About 39% of evangelicals believe it's morally permissible to provide, quote, compassionate care in, in, in mercy killing if, yeah. if someone's suffering seems unbearable. Now, when 39% of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ feel it is preferable to, um, to have three grams of phenobarbital injected into your veins rather than deal with suffering, then we have to understand, what are we hearing about suffering from our pulpits? Yeah. Do we have a biblical worldview on suffering? Do we know how to handle it? How do we engage it? And Jim, what is so disconcerting is that um, these fears that people have about suffering have been translated into what most people think is very rational social policy. Let's have society aid us, help us in death with, with a lethal injection. You know, you have said a lot right there, Johnny. Mm -hmm. When you look at the issue of developing courage, you know, I'm mindful of the scripture where Paul writes about suffering leading to endurance, endurance leading to character, and character hope. We're not very good with that. No, we're not. That is not our, our expertise in Western civilization. No, but you know, I think a lot of this, this discussion can be traced back to this U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1973, which uh, ruled that there is an inherent, quote, uh, right of privacy in our Constitution, mm. and right there gave birth to the entitlement culture. We live in an entitlement culture which has made idols of, of um, autonomy, personal choice. It's made idols of comfort, 
convenience, and, and when you add to this mix despair, then that is a formula for uh, opting for assisted suicide. My hope is that pastors and pulpits, that small group Bible studies, that people when they discuss these topics over a cup of coffee at Starbucks <laughs> or the backyard fence or at PTA or in their carpool or um, with her coworkers, it, my hope is that Christians will be able to articulate not only a biblical worldview on suffering, but help people find virtue in affliction, uh. help people find courage in facing uh, the challenges of, of disability. Um, because That's critical. I mean, what you're saying is critical for us to understand. Absolutely, and it, and it flies in the face of our entitlement culture. We want a healthy life. It we does. want a comfortable life. We want life to go our way. And when disease or disability or aging or pain, especially pain, begins to encroach on our comfort, on our convenience, um, we start to despair. Let me ask you in that regard, when you look at quality of life and all the things you just mentioned, um, the able body person listening who hasn't lived a day in your shoes, we don't understand what you have to go through. And your husband, Ken, is here, and he has been such a great support to you, and I know that from the times we spent together. But help, help us better understand why we should not support um, some of those movements in this country where they're proposing termination of life because we see it as a poorer quality of life. And who are we to judge that? Well, first, I mean, you're speaking from experience. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, it, does it ever frustrate you or make you upset? Well, that I, I, a able-bodied person, would have some kind of judgment on you? Well, yes, Jim, it, it does, because it tells me that you think little of mm. my abilities, you think little of my uh, years of cultivation of patience, endurance, self-control, long-suffering, compassion toward other people who hurt. You know, suffering is the textbook that teaches us who we really are. Mm -hmm. And we all would like to think that we are paragons of virtue, but suffering is God's choicest tool in molding our character. And, and my, my quality of life may seem poor to many people when I rehearse that, that list. You know, somebody doing my toileting routines, bed, bath, feeding me, dressing me, you know, all my autonomy's out the window, uh, you know, your quality of life is nothing, but, but I'm an image bearer of God. And that makes the difference. You have to wake up in the morning and remember that. Thank God for my disability. Because I don't think most people wake up in the morning and think, hey, I I'm a reflector of God. I, I bear his image. That's a big responsibility. It is. And it's not based on pride, which of course is the essence of autonomy and personal choice. No, when we reflect on the fact that we are image bearers of a great almighty God, it humbles us. It makes us humble. We, we receive happily anything from the hand of God, even if it was from the left hand of God. Affliction, pain, aging, disappointment, despair. I mean, th these are things that are tough to grapple with. Let me ask you about that because uh, we've covered it in other programs we've done together. But I know someone's listening today who is in a spot where they are bitter toward God. It may not be you know, physical ailment, it could be, but it might be something else, a broken family, divorce, a wayward child, whatever is in their heart where God has let them down, their expectations have not been met. How, with your experience, with your physical constraints, how would you coach a person to say, this does not matter how I love my God, how I love my Lord, how I trust my Lord, how I depend upon my Lord. You walk it every day, and I use that word correctly. You walk it every day. But talk to that troubled soul. And again, we, we could have all of our physical capability, and we're broken in this area. How do you do it? Well, first, it's totally understandable. Um, Jim, there are so many mornings after 50 years of quadriplegia where I wake up, and to be quite honest, my quadriplegia is somewhat of a walk in the park next to my struggle with chronic pain. It is so difficult. Please don't ask me to explain how a quadriplegic feels pain. I can't explain it, but I have other quadriplegic friends who feel the same. And, and 
It, it just wears at your resolve. It erodes your joy like corrosive acid. It just eats mm. away at your peace of mind. You begin to doubt the goodness of God. I understand. I get it. I resonate when people struggle with these things. But not only do I resonate, the Bible resonates with people. I mean, even the Apostle Paul in Corinthians, he said to his friends, my brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships we endured in Asia. We were overwhelmed far beyond our ability to endure. We even had in our hearts the sting of death. Now, basically what the Apostle Paul is saying there is, I'd rather die than go through this. Right. You guys don't understand. It was hard. We were, we were totally overwhelmed. And, and Jim, I just know there are listeners right now who can identify with that statement. Take heart, an apostle knows exactly how you feel. Uh -huh. Not just John Erickson Tata, a biblical apostle knows how you feel. But, and right at the end of that little list of his woes, he says, but, and I love buts <laughs> in scripture, buts. don't you? Yeah. Uh, but these things happen that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God mm. who raises the dead. And oh my goodness, if God can raise the dead, he can raise me up in the morning out of my chronic pain. He can raise our listeners when they are overwhelmed by uh, the needs of their disabled child, their elderly parent for whom they're caring. God's grace is sufficient. And sometimes I don't think we as Christ followers understand how deep and wide and great the grace of God is unless we suffer. But Jim, I've told you this before, I wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna believe, I'm, okay, today I'm gonna believe what? Isaiah chapter 60, verse one. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rests upon you. I'm going to believe that. Psalm 119, verse 50 says, My comfort in suffering is this, your promises renew my life. And so sometimes Ken drives me to Johnny and Friends down the 101 freeway for 18 minutes. And what am I doing? Rehearsing the promises of God. Yeah. Because God, you tell me that these things are going to renew my life. So I'm going to believe you. And I think that's what Jesus meant in John chapter six, when he said, you need to eat my flesh. You need to drink my blood. That was an offensive statement to most people. And only a few followers understood what he meant. You have to ingest his grace. You have to feed on it, not just daily, moment by moment when you suffer. Yeah. But I tell you what, when you do, you discover Jesus is ecstasy beyond compare and it's worth anything to be his friend. He's that precious and that sweet. And that is why I want people not to look to despair and hopelessness and physician-assisted suicide and mercy killing. I want them to find Jesus in the midst of their afflictions. Many can't, but the onus is on the church to get a biblical view on suffering and apply it to their neighbors, their friends, their relatives, their co-workers who are despairing. Johnny, you, you've written the first edition of this book, I think 25 years ago, and you have re-released it, updated it. When you look at the change in the culture in 25 years, wh what have you noticed? I mean, you're seeing this every day. Many of us aren't looking at it mm. in the same way you do. So you've been at the helm of this movement to protect life, what are the changes like and what scares you, what gives you hope? Well, my concerns about um, physician-assisted suicide began really in 1982 and I was on an airplane reading a newspaper. It was about uh, um, a, a child, an infant with Down syndrome who was starved to death in a hospital and it was upheld mm. by the state Supreme Court. Mm. And I looked at that and thought, oh my goodness, you know, th this is what the abortion ruling in 1973 is bringing us. People warned us about this. Francis Schaeffer warned us about this in 1973, and we're seeing it come to reality. Connect those dots quickly, because some people, maybe people that aren't Christian, they don't understand this. They may be Christian, not pro-life. Why do those dots connect for you? Hmm. Well, because in the Supreme Court ruling back in 1973, uh, judges determined that there is an inherent, quote, right to privacy in the U.S. Constitution. And when that was determined, that opened the door to an exercise of personal rights in every single realm. However, over the time, that's become um, morphed into this into this competition between whose rights are more important than whose. And so no, no longer are rights moral claims based on the word of God, but rights over, over the years have become nothing more than people's willful determinations, all dressed up in politically correct language, calling mm -hmm. them rights. But really it's what I want when I want, and I want it now. 
Including my own death. Exactly, and including the, the entitlement culture that we find ourselves in. And when people start viewing rights as willful determinations such as that, and when they disengage rights from their moral basis in, in, in the Word of God, then the exercise of rights becomes nothing but a national competition between who is more victimized and who. And I think we see that happening in our country now. We have become a haranguing group of individuals who have radicalized rights um, based on the interpretation from 1973's ruling. And, and now it, it's, it's uh, no one does anything for the common good of the country. All moral consensus has, has uh, r unraveled and we've become a bunch of forgive me, spoiled brats yeah. who just want what we want when we want it. Very much the me culture, and it's getting more me-centric, it seems, each and every day. Well, there was a movie, what was it, last summer or two summers ago, Me Before You, and it was a story mm. of a quadriplegic who uh, felt that his quality of life was, was nothing, and even though he loved his personal care assistant, he opted for suicide. And all of his family and all of his friends said he made a courageous, noble, dignified decision. And I'm th sitting there in the audience as a quadriplegic thinking, no, he didn't. Yeah. He, he opted out. He, 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 he took the cowardly way out. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some people thinking, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm suffering pain. Mm. I'm, I'm going through intractable pain. Well, if we are dealing with pain, and I'm, I'm one with you, then let's pour our resources not into the advancement of giving people special rights to die. No, let's pour our resources into developing better pain management techniques, um, better hospice, better palliative care. Mm. Let's help people deal with anger. Let's give them social supports, bring them out of uh, social isolation. Let's provide spiritual community. Let's be a friend to these people and walk the journey with them. Mm. Johnny, you also mentioned back when you were at the beginning of this journey that people helped you get this perspective, that you did have down days. I mean, I you're a very buoyant spirit. You see that. And in fact, some people who have followed you and know your ministry would say, yeah, Johnny's got that capacity to stay on top of these things. But talk about the help that came around you, those that picked Absolutely. you up in your despair. What did that look like? Well, back then, it's still painful for me to remember it. I would, I'd been released from the hospital. I was spending that summer in a deep depression. I, 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 I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I, I would drink. Um, I, I found some friends who weren't Christians who would come over on a Friday night and they'd sneak me their beers and, and mm. uh, you know, scotch and soda became a favorite and I, I began to deaden my pain with, mm. with alcohol. Of course, I was what, only 18, 19, 20 years old, but, but an alarm went off in my head and God introduced me to a couple of Christians who intervened and started to make a difference. And they didn't treat me like a project. I wasn't their you know, despairing neighbor who you know, needed to have a friend, so I'm gonna do the admirable thing and become her friend. No, they, they were my friends. They got engaged with me. They, they, they took me to Bob's Big Boy to get burgers. <laughs> they, they took me shopping. They, they, You're just one of them. I was one of them and it made all the difference in the world and I think it was those Christians who began to share with me perspectives from the Word of God, the fact that uh, we don't own our bodies, God wants to honor him with our bodies, which he paid for with his own death. Mm. Um, God is against murder, he's against suicide, which stands to reason he would be against self-murder. Uh, God loves life, death is the last enemy. and and. Uh, we are to do all we can to sustain life. As long as we have a breath, there is a purpose, there's a meaning. Even if it's a small gesture of encouragement that you might offer to others. I'm thinking of a woman named Kim, real quickly. She uh, had a neuromuscular disease. She was despairing of her life. Uh, her elder at her church called me and asked if I would please call and talk to Kim because she was considering um, opting out of life and not going on a ventilator. Uh -huh. She was so depressed. And I got her on the phone, and after some long conversation about prayer and, and heaven and, and uh, courage and whatnot, I, I said to her, Kim, I'm gonna give you a Bible verse that's gonna change your life. It's from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse eight. And it says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. And I said, Kim, we all know the old adage that God looks at a thousand years as just a couple of days gone by. 
But have you ever thought of the other side of that verse? That he looks at our days as worth a thousand years? A thousand years worth of opportunity to invest in his kingdom? I said, Kim, when your mother comes to give you your meal tonight and syringes your, your meal into your G-tube because she was fed with a right. feeding tube, why don't, you, why don't you just say to your mom, let me say a blessing. Let me say a blessing over my food before you syringe that into me. Just do that, Kim. I know your focus is on yourself and your pain, but try reaching out because that small momentary act of courage has got to pan out to at least 579 years worth of eternal <laughs> benefit to your mother, bliss for yourself, and glory to God. Start living that way. Look beyond yourself, even though you're on your, quote, deathbed, and care about others. I mean, look at Jesus. He was on his cross, and he's... And what's he doing? He's dying, but he's also ministering to this man crucified next to him, and he's counseling his mother about who she should live I with. And, I mean, he's doing all these it's things amazing. on his cross, his own deathbed. She began to take my advice. Um, when people would come over to uh, do a Bible study by her bedside, she, with great effort, because her breathing was labored, would say, let me share with you my favorite Bible verse. And of course, everybody is stunned silence listening to her, this courageous woman. And it was so encouraging, and her mother told me that Kim lived another, I think it was three months after our conversation, but she said, Johnny, those are the most meaningful months my daughter ever lived, because she believed that what she did with her small gestures of encouragement and courage and, and um, boosting the spirits of others and bolstering um, others' perspectives on her suffering, she believed it panned out to at least 59,000 years worth of eternal benefit to her hmm. and bliss for others and glory to God. And she put a value on it that Bible verse from First Peter chapter three gave her, and those were some of the most meaningful weeks she lived. Thank you, she said. And to be honest, um, Jim, Kim's not alone. It's the way I live every day. Mm. I have to push in the back of my thinking. I have to push back pain. I have to find something that's more interesting, that demands my focus, that's more engaging than my pain. And what is it? First Peter chapter three, verse eight. I don't want to diminish my eternal estate. I don't want to jeopardize it. I want to live life well. Hmm. I want to live life well. I think that is dying with dignity because we're all yeah. dying each and every day. We hmm. die to self each and every day, right? But we rise to Jesus and we're yeah. all preparing for that final exit. And I just want to make certain that my death will be a good death because I have lived well. Johnny, that is well said. I mean, all of us pass through that, that threshold. No one's going to escape it, whether you're able body or you have some physical uh, disabilities. And you have yeah. expressed it so well today. Well, that's so why I wrote that book, When Is It Right to Die? I really wanted to uh, give Christ's followers a keen understanding of the arguments surrounding physician-assisted suicide as well as give them a language yeah so that they could engage their own uh, uh, neighbors and friends and churchgoers in a biblical worldview of not only life, but death. Yes, Johnny Erickson Tata, thank you for being such a great example of how to do that so well. In your book, When Is It Right to Die? What a resource for every Christian home. Thanks, Jim. Hey, I'm John Fuller and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.